Hello again and welcome back to our series of lectures on human pharmacology. As mentioned at the beginning of the first lecture, it's important that we get, right, we get the correct route of administration for each of the drugs that, that we plan to administer to the patient. And so in this lecture today, what we're going to be focusing on is exactly that. The various routes of drug administration that can be utilised and the advantages and disadvantages of those routes. This diagram here just takes the view that what you've got is you've got to get the blood into the plasma so that it can circulate around the body and then go to where you need. So for example, you, you've got a headache, you take an oral analgesic tablet such as aspirin or paracetamol or whatever. That's taken orally and it goes into the gut and from the gut it's absorbed, passes into the circulation and then gets distributed. So what this diagram does is try to summarise the various routes. So over here we've got the administration, which could be oral, as we mentioned there, for the painkiller. It can be rectal. It can be through the skin, percutaneous, intravenous, directly into the blood vessel, intramuscular, intrathecal into the cerebrospinal fluid, or even inhalation into the lung. Those are all the routes of administration that we'll come on and talk about. But ultimately, you'll see the two we arrows. They all end up potentially in the plasma. And from there, they can be distributed around the body. And then eventually, they will be eliminated by these roots over here. In the urine, in the feces, in the sweat, in the, in the expired air, etc. So we're going to be looking at each of these routes of administration in turn and discussing the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of each. We start with the parenteral roots. The parental roots are the ones that avoid the gut, if you like, the ones that avoid the digestive tract. So we have probably the, probably the second most utilised route after oral, and that's intravenous. You know, things like an IV drip, an IV injection of a compound. Now, the advantages of that is 100% of the dose administered is absorbed because you're injecting the dose right into the circulation. There's no absorption from a primary site. It's straight to the, the, the vasculature. You can stagger it. You can give a small injection. You can give a small amount and then another bolus. Or you can give it through a constant infusion pump over a long period of time. Or through an intravenous drip, obviously. Key things, though, it bypasses the GI tract and it bypasses other routes. Those are both good things to get it right into the circulation. Disadvantages though, and these are important, once you've given it, you can't get rid of it. It's in there. You can't withdraw it. You can sometimes get an anaphylactic shock reaction to an IV bolus injection. That has to be borne in mind. You've also got to be well aware of embolism and also infection. Now, infection nowadays is very, very low risk because of the, the hygiene practices that are in place. You know, if you've ever had an intravenous injection or had an IV or had a blood sample removed, you'll be well aware that you know, the whole area gets wiped down with an alcohol wipe for, for, for cleanliness before they even start. And then the needles and the syringes are all sterilised in packets. So the risk of infection is very low, but, you know, for example, drugs of abuse that we mentioned in the first lecture you know, things like heroin can be injected intravenously and there is a risk of cross-infection there in that situation. But in a clinical setting, highly unlikely that we would see an infection risk. As well as given it intra-arterially, drugs can also be given intra-arterially and that is, you know, that's a much more risky procedure, very, very high risk. Very limited situations where you would inject into an artery. Probably diagnostic radiography is one of the best examples because then you can look at perfusion issues of an organ looking at the blood flow by taking in some sort of carrier in the artery. Also in cancer treatment, regional cancer treatment can be given into various vascular beds during, you know, so that can be a, a way of giving you know, chemotherapy because you can get a very high concentration, get to a very local site of action. You know thereby minimising the systemic risks 
that we, we talked about when we were looking in the first lecture, we, we mentioned about um, you know, this idea that you know, the, <clears throat> a drug is not necessarily removed from the market because it's got toxicity. An example we talked about was chemotherapy. So this way you can minimise the, the, the systemic risk of chemotherapy, but it's a very, very high risk procedure and is used in very, very limited circumstances. <clears throat> Intramuscular, probably one of the easiest ones to give. Um, little irritation of pain, that's probably easy enough to say, but I suppose it depends on what muscle they stick the needle into, whether you would consider it to be lacking in irritation or pain. Yeah? The thing to remember is, although it is rapidly absorbed from muscle, you don't get all the drug absorbed. It's not, it's not the same as IV where it's 100% absorption. You then get the skin roots, very slow absorption from here. Can be quite a bit more painful. What you do is you're giving it into the muscle, you're going through the cutaneous layers to get to the muscle. But giving it by this route, you're going just under, the, you're going to the skin, and the skin is loaded with nociceptive fibres, pain fibres. So this can be quite a painful procedure. Yeah but very useful for the administration um, of local anaesthetics, for example. So, we mentioned the skin, very slow absorption rate, and the absorption rate depends primarily on the lipid solubility of the ingredient. Now, <clears throat> if you apply something to the skin, it has to, so this isn't like percutaneous or subcutaneous, it's got to be absorbed through the skin layer. The reason you need the lipid solubility is to get through the phospholipid bilayer which makes up the cell membrane. Not usually a problem since often it's applied as a topical application anyway for a topical problem. So absorption, although slow, is not necessarily an issue with something applied to the skin. You've then got the alveolar route of the inhalation. Now, this way, the drug comes in, it's breathed in, and it goes into the respiratory tract. Maintenance gaseous anaesthetics are given this way, but also things like nebulizers and inhalers. Perfect route for those because the inhaled drug is actually been taken into the airways, and if you're giving something like salbutamol, which is a bronchodilator for the treatment of asthma, it's going to hit the, the airways and cause the relaxation of the smooth muscle. So you're not so concerned in that case with a drug like salbutamol about absorption because the site of action is the location of administration, i.e. The, the, the respiratory tract. Probably the easiest way to give a drug and the easiest way for us to take a drug is per os, PO, through the mouth. And when drug companies are designing their drugs and synthesizing them and, and if you like working on the structure, depending on the therapeutic approach they're looking for, they're more often than not looking to see can this drug be given orally, either in tablet or liquid form. It's convenient, it's acceptable to us as the patient, and it's relatively low cost. But of course, it then has to be absorbed from the gut. So it's got to have the right pharmacokinetics to have a good absorption rate from the, the, the GI tract. So once a drug is given, it then has to be absorbed. It's got to get into the bloodstream to pass right around the body. Um, question that's often asked, uh, you know, I remember when I started doing pharmacology, my, my own mum asked me, um, when I take a painkiller, how does it know to go to my head? And obviously I had to explain to her, well no, it goes into your stomach, it gets absorbed, it gets into the bloodstream, it passes all the way around your body in the vasculature, and it has an impact where it needs to have the impact, but it's going everywhere else as well. So it's all about administering the drug, and in order to get it, particularly for oral administration, which we said is the preferred route, You've got to make sure that the drug's got the right chemistry, the right formulation to get it absorbed. Now, it's got to deal with a pH of about 5 or 6, because that's what the intestinal mucosa pH is, and that's where the absorption is going to take place. The intestinal mucosa, there's a huge surface area, a very, very big surface area for absorption, 
and that's where most of these drugs will be absorbed. You've also got to have a good blood supply in the area where you're absorbing it, so it gets absorbed at the mucosa, the mucosa's got a big blood supply, it gets absorbed, passes into the blood, and then gets circulated around the body. You've also got to bear in mind that you're putting it into a system, you know, um, that's, you know, that if you like, it's going into the stomach, it's passing from the stomach into the intestine, you know, so the, the drugs are really absorbed from the small intestine, not the stomach, but there are some exceptions to that, you know, it wouldn't be a rule if there weren't exceptions, for example, most drugs will be, will be absorbed through the small intestine, not the stomach, except alcohol and aspirin are two probably of the best known examples of those that are absorbed by other ways. What affects the absorption? This is where the chemistry kicks in. Usually when you mention the word chemistry or biochemistry, people lose the will to live, freak out, panic, it's going to be hard, it's got chemistry in the word. Yeah. Don't panic, it's fairly straightforward, we're going to keep it at the level that you, you need to know. We're not going to get into in-depth chemistry here, thinking about structures, etc. Now, it does depend though on the degree of ionisation of the drug. Yeah. So, if a drug tends to produce ions when in solution, then that will usually, you know, you've usually then got to think, okay, um, that might affect their absorption, you know, um, and so therefore the, the degree of ionization impacts on the absorption and can cause a level of unpredictability. So you need to know that. Yeah. So if they produce ions, they won't be absorbed from the gut easily and their absorption will be erratic. So lower levels of ionization kind of a potential impact here. You've also got to think of lipid solubility. <coughs> Excuse me. They've got to cross cell membranes. They've got to come across the intestinal mucosa cells. They've got to cross then the blood vessel wall. They've got to then pass into the blood vessel. So there's lots of cell membranes to pass as they're sh shooting around the body, going from the mucosa, intestinal mucosa to the blood, and the blood to the organ that they're going to work on and back and so on. So we need to have that lipid solubility. It's also good if it's got a small molecular radius because that eases the absorption and crossing through the membranes. <coughs> the thing about absorption, it, it can be affected by a whole host of other factors. Probably one of the most obvious ones is that the presence of food in the stomach, if you're taking an oral medication, can actually affect the absorption. Yeah. But it's not always affected the same way. Some drugs, their absorption will be increased, some will be decreased. That's why if you're taking a tablet and you read a little bit of paper inside the packet or in the prescription itself, it might say to be taken before food, with food or after food. Or it might say to be taken two hours after food. That's to allow the gastric emptying to happen so that the drug will then not be affected by the presence of food. If you take it with food, that's because the presence of food in the system will enhance the absorption of the medication. So it's not always the same response. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Now, the other thing we've got to bear in mind is you've got the gastric acids, the gastric juices, if you like, all the enzymes that are in the intestine. They've got the potential to be destroying your drug before it's even been absorbed. Now, sometimes then, if that's likely to happen to a particular drug, the drug will be formulated to have what we call an enteric coat. It's like a protective coating. It might be a fat, it might be a wax, a cellulose coating, that type of thing. And what happens is that that allows, those particular coatings don't get, a, get destroyed or broken down in the stomach, but do in the intestine. So what that means is the gastric juices in the stomach will have no impact on the drug because the drug's protected by the coating. It passes through the stomach into the intestine. The conditions within the intestine break down these outer coatings, leaving the drug free to be absorbed. The reason these, these coatings that we use don't have any, or are, not, are not affected in the stomach is that they're resistant to the pepsin that, you know, that's found there. So therefore you don't get the breakdown. Now, this allows you then to get a higher dose to the site of absorption in the intestine 
by using these coatings. <coughs> Another way that you can give a drug is to give what we call a sustained release preparation. Yeah? Now, this is almost like a, a matrix with layers of drugs. So, in very simple things, if you imagine you've got a drug core, a matrix, a drug layer on the outside, then matrix, drug, matrix, all of that, the, the, the outer matrix dissolves and then you release some of the drug. Then the next layer of the matrix dissolves, you release some more of the drug. And that can be useful when you're trying to get a sustained release. For example, hormone replacement therapy, um, or you know, HRT, um, contraceptive pills, etc. can often be slow release preparations. It avoids the systemic effects of a very large dose having to be given. You can give a large dose, but meter it out in specific lower doses by giving it alongside this matrix. And so therefore, if you give it, say, in a, in a you know, HRT um, under the skin or in a patch, it will be very localised in terms of its release. Once you've got it absorbed, it's then got to be distributed. Because you've got it into the stomach, you've got it through the stomach and into the, the intestine. It's been absorbed from there, it's in the bloodstream, it now needs to be distributed. And the distribution of the drug through the bloodstream depends on albumin, which is a, a protein, if you have a plasma protein, binding protein, that's found in the blood. And this is essential for getting effects of the drug beyond the bloodstream, allowing it to be carried. The, the drugs that are highly protein bound, a high proportion of those will stay attached to this and will stay in the blood. What you want then is a lower binding because it's the unbound drugs that will ultimately leave the bloodstream and then, so they'll be carried to a certain extent but then they can leave the bloodstream to have the therapeutic activity to be metabolised, broken down and ultimately excreted. So, <coughs> there's a drug product, it's come in and it's been absorbed and it's now in the blood. It passes to the tissues, receptors, it goes to various sites of metabolism and then the metabolism breaks it down or undergoes chemical change and then it gets past, you know, then it can be excreted. So that's a very simple diagram. In it comes, circulate it, metabolize it, excrete it. Nice simple set of steps to give you a basic overview of what's happening with these drugs. Now, at this, you know, I'm, I'm recording this at the beginning of a new year and everywhere is filled with, the press is filled with, it's time to detox. Do this, do that, do the next thing. Which is all total rubbish, obviously. Our body has probably the single best detoxification facility that we know of. We don't need to do anything else to detox. The body will detox. The body takes in what we take in, utilises it, breaks it down and excretes it and clears it away with, with, with the waste products, what we don't need. So therefore, metabolism of a drug is part of that detoxification process. Again, I've said it before, it wouldn't be the rule if there wasn't an exception. And although we say that you know the whole thing about metabolism is to avoid the concentration of a drug building up too much, you need to give it, have it to work, break it down, clear it out, take the next dose. It wouldn't be a rule if there wasn't an exception. The exception is, in some cases, and we'll mention a few later on, some drugs need to be metabolised to become active. So you give a pro-drug or a pre-drug, and once it's in the body, the metabolic processes make it active. So bear that in mind. Metabolism is basically a result of an enzyme, enzymatic changes which alter the structure of the drug. And it's that change in structure you will get a loss of therapeutic activity. Normally, but not always because of this. You know, we'll come back to that idea of sometimes the metabolism is activating a compound. Where do we find these enzymes that are going to metabolise the drug? Kidney, lungs, plasma, nerve. Most common site of metabolism though is the liver, and we'll mention that later. Now, 
The liver, as we said, is the major site. Now, what we need to do is we need to change something about it, the drug. So, what happens is when, you, when the drug's first in the body, the enzymes that are going to metabolise that drug are free. So therefore, initial doses are metabolised very, very high rate because there's plenty of the enzymes to do it. Now, as you administer more of the drug, there are fewer and fewer free enzymes, so the metabolic rate slows down. Yeah. So therefore, the, you know, the first dose that you give is metabolised much more quickly than all subsequent doses. And that's known as first pass metabolism. So therefore, if you want to achieve the therapeutic dose quickly, you often give a dose which is a loading dose. Basically, you load it up and you fill up the enzymes that are going to break the drug down and then you come on board with the actual concentration that will have a slower metabolic rate and therefore circulate at a higher concentration. So metabolism in the liver, which is the primary site, consists of two phases. Phase one, phase two. For one of the few occasions in science, we have named the phases in a normal, sensible way. Usually they come up with weird and wonderful titles. Here, the first phase is something called phase one. The second phase is something called phase two. Nice and simple. So phase one changes the structure of the drug through a chemical reaction. Now that can be oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis. This involves the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Then you get phase two. You add a further chemical grouping to the drug. So the molecule is now bigger and much more difficult to distribute to the tissues. Things like you add sulfate groups, glutathione, glucuronide, all of these different things freely available in the liver sites. And that's known as conjugation. So what we've got here, here's an example. Phase one, aspirin. What you've done here, you take an aspirin and you put it through phase one metabolism and what you'll notice here is you've actually got the OC, OCH3 becoming OH. So you basically get rid of that and that and that and two of those. Yeah. That becomes salicylic acid. And salicylic acid then has a glucuronide added to it, and that's the conjugation phase. Active, inactive. Simple as that. The exception to the rule that we mentioned was that although metabolism is primarily to deactivate drugs, it can also be used to activate chemicals as well. So a prodrug is given. A prodrug is an agent that's given in an inactive state that once it gets into the system, the metabolic processes that it undergoes activate it and give it therapeutic activity. So, this, it's the exact same group of enzymes, the cytochrome P450 enzymes, that deactivate most drugs that can also be utilised to activate prodrugs. The other thing that metabolism can do is convert an active drug to another active derivative. Best example of that is the benzodiazepines, the anxiolytic drugs. Midazepam active. In the body it gets oxida oxidation processes, make it diazepam. So that's active, so is this. You then go through a demethylation process to give you nordiaxepam, also active. And then hydroxylation, oxazepam also active. You need to be aware of that, that if your met metabolic breakdown products are also active agents, that could lead to an increased risk of toxicity if you overload it with too much of the drug. So, metabolism in the liver. So, high concentrations of the drug will induce the enzymes, so you get an increased capacity for metabolism. If you give too much of a drug, give an overdose, then you might actually then induce alternative mechanisms. So what's happening is, enzymes sitting over here, and this enzyme here, 
is the one that's going to act, it's going to metabolize the drug. You bring in the drug and it gets metabolized and taken away, broken down. You swamp it with an overdose and then this enzyme is now no longer able to do anything else. So the, the, drugs that's not, the drug that's not being metabolized actually activates a different enzyme system. So a good example, paracetamol. Normally we take a couple of tablets in a dose. That's a gram, two 500 milligram tablets. Now, if you were to take 20 tablets, that would be a 10 gram dose. That's an example where that dose of 10 grams would swamp the normal metabolic systems and activate an alternative route. And in the alternative route, you activate a hydroxylamine derivative of paracetamol and that reacts with cell proteins and actually causes cellular damage. Now, since this is all taking place in the liver, the cells that are damaged are the liver cells and it can result, can result in liver failure. That's why there's a limitation on the number of paracetamol you can buy. You walk into a supermarket or a pharmacist, they will sell you, you know, no more than two small packets of paracetamol because of that. <clears throat> it's interesting, you can walk into the same, two super, same supermarket and fill your trolley full of high strength alcohol and they'll happily let you wheel it out the door and we know what that might do to your liver. Paracetamol is limited. Once, the, once we're, the drugs come in, it's been absorbed, it's been circulated, distributed, it's had its effect, it's been broken down, we now need to start treating the products. So, fecal excretion, bile, expired air, urine, standard routes of administration. It's important to know which route is used, because for example, if if, the, if a drug is primarily excreted in the urine and a patient or, or individual has um, kidney problems, that can affect the rate of excretion. And therefore, if the kidney is not functioning properly, the drug may not be excreted at the right rate and you might get a build up to toxic levels. Now, that urine excretion requiring functional kidney, you've got to be very well aware of that. And if you look at things like the British National Formulary or, what, or other sources that tell you about the action of drugs, you'll often have a, a, a list of things known as contraindications. Situations or conditions where a drug should not be recommended or, or, or prescribed. And often that will say not to be given to patients with impaired kidney function or kidney failure. That invariably means that that drug is primarily excreted through the urine. And if the kidneys weren't functioning, it would not be excreted and would therefore have the potential to build up to potentially toxic levels. So, the drugs get into the urine through filtration at the glomerulus. They diffuse there from the blood. And it's basically through active transport that gets it into the tubules in the kidney. You know, so, um, so that, that gets it carried from the... You know, pass through the blood, gets into the urine, and then you will excrete it through your urinary output. Now, the renal clearance that, then for most of these compounds that come out through the urine, you calculate it by looking at the concentration of drug that's in the urine, the rate of urine production, divided by the concentration of drug in the plasma. So, the, if there's more drug in the plasma, this level will be high, that ratio then will be low, so there will be low clearance of the drug. If the drug starts to move from the plasma to the, through the kidneys, this level falls, that level rises, the rate of clearance goes up. Simple as that. But the whole thing is obviously also affected by the rate of urine production. So therefore, if there's a malfun malfunction within the kidney that's affecting urine production, and the level of urine production, the rate of production is low, clearance will also be low. Therefore, the drug has the potential to build up. So what we've seen in this short topic is that 
we need to work out first of all the best way to give the drug, the route of administration, and there are advantages and disadvantages to all the ways. Once it's in there, it's got to be absorbed from the site of action, unless you do it straight into the blood. Once it's absorbed, it's just circulated. It then goes to its site of action, has its impact, and comes back. It then gets metabolised in kidney, nerve, but primarily the liver is the main site. And once it's been metabolised, you then excrete the compound and the byproducts from the body to stop the potential build-up to toxic levels. So, nice and simple. Administration, absorption, distribution, effect, metabolism, excretion. That's the summary. Those six points are the key things to remember. Just one more time. Administration, absorption, distribution, action, metabolism, excretion. Simple as that. Thank you.